So uh, today uh, we will uh, I will introduce you to my uh, PhD project, which is called uh, Nectar, and to the related studies on the solar cells uh, technologies. So uh, let's start uh, now with uh, a general introduction to the Nectar project. So first of all, Nectar is the acronym for uh, nuclear reactions at storage rings. And uh, the proposal of the Nectar project is to uh, determine the newton inducer reaction cross-section of a radioactive uh, nuclei. So uh, this cross-section play a key role in uh, several domains. Uh, for example, for applications uh, in nuclear technology, we can say, for example, nuclear energy industry or in uh, nuclear medicine. But uh, also they are very important for nuclear astrophysics, uh, in particular because they are a key input uh, for modeling the uh, element nucleosynthesis through, for example, the slow process or the rapid process. So um, in general, we are interesting on uh, 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 newton inducer reactions at energies below uh, 5 mV per nucleon. So at this energy, uh, the neutral induced reaction can be described as a, a two-step process, where uh, in the first step, uh, we have the so-called formation. So uh, the neutron um, is uh, absorbed by uh, the target uh, nucleus. And uh, this uh, lead, uh, leads to the formation of an intermediate state, uh, which is called a compound nucleus, uh, which is in an excited state. And uh, after that, uh, we have the second step, uh, which is called decay, where this uh, compound nucleus can decay uh, following different channels, for example, by fissioning, uh, emitting gamma rays, or for example, by uh, the emission of a neutron. So each one of these uh, uh, decay channel uh, is uh, characterized by a probability, and uh, the sum of these probabilities must be equal to one. So now uh, in uh, traditional experiments, what is uh, done is to measure directly uh, the neutron induced reaction cross section. So this means that in, in general, a neutron beam is uh, uh, provided uh, using a source and uh, is made uh, interact uh, with uh, a heavy uh, target nucleus. So in this way, uh, we produce this uh, compound nucleus and then the decay of this compound nucleus is uh, observed detecting, for example, the fission fragments, uh, the gamma rays uh, or the neutrons. So now this way to measure uh, the newton induced uh, reaction uh, works uh, quite well uh, until when we are close to the stability valley. But the problem is that uh, uh, when uh, uh, the target is uh, radioactive, uh, uh, things uh, start to become quite uh, challenging. First of all, for experimentally, the main problem is that uh, uh, we need, first of all, to uh, produce and uh, handle the required uh, uh, target. And this is something uh, of quite uh, difficult, in particular, if we are speaking about a very uh, high radioactive tar uh, isotope. At the same time, uh, uh, we have the problem this, this, that these uh, targets uh, are also a, a source of a huge background, for example, a gamma ray uh, alpha, but also a spontaneous fission background that they can uh, uh, make very uh, difficult uh, detect uh, the product, products coming from the decay of the compound nucleus. So uh, the problem, however, is also theoretical because uh, if we are not able to uh, perform the measurement in, in this way, uh, we can also think that maybe we can uh, try to evaluate these cross-sections using the theoretical calculations. But this is not uh, easy because uh, um, the description, description of the, the excitation process of the compound nucleus is quite uh, uh, complicated, difficult, and uh, also the theoretical prediction uh, have huge uh, uncertainties. So uh, what is clear is that uh, in order to measure this newton induced reaction cross-section, we should find uh, another way that maybe is able to uh, help us. So first of all, we can try, for example, to reverse the kinematics. So we take uh, our uh, heavy, uh, target, uh, heavy target and we, we accelerate this uh, uh, nucleus, this radioactive nucleus. And in this way, we can solve, for example, the problem of the target radioactivity. Uh, on the other side, however, uh, in, uh, in this specific case of newton inducer reaction, if we want to use the inverse kinematic, we should uh, provide a, a neutron free target. And at the moment, uh, this kind of targets are not available. So we should try again. Uh, and uh, the point is that uh, we should try to find a way uh, to, to reach uh, this compound nucleus when, uh, uh, the, the, when the form, this formation channel, so this uh, interaction where we have the neutron, um, that is absorbed by the target is not possible to reach due to the high radioactivity of the target. 
So the most promising approach from this point of view is to use the surrogate reaction method. So the idea of the surrogate reaction method is to provide an alternative way. Uh, so a, a combination, if it is available, between a beam and a target that uh, allow us to reach the same compound nucleus that uh, we uh, reach uh, using the newton induced reaction, and then measure the decay probabilities uh, of the compound nucleus provided by uh, the use of this technique. Uh, measuring again uh, the products like the fission fragments, the gamma rays, uh, or the nucleons. So now one of the greatest advantages of the surrogate reactions is that uh, if you are not uh, so far from the stability valley and if it is available, uh, this uh, specific combination of a beam and the target, we should try, uh, we can, for example, use a target that is uh, stable or uh, less radioactive uh, respect to the one that uh, we were supposed to use in the neutron induced reaction. So then, as I say, we can measure the decay probabilities of the compound nucleus, which are using the surrogate reaction, and then use these uh, uh, probabilities to infer the neutron-induced reaction cross-section of interest. The question now, however, is uh, how well does uh, uh, this uh, method work? So first of all, the first point that we needed to uh, remark is that uh, in order to use the surrogate reaction method, the uh, neutron induced reaction of interest should proceed through the formation of a compound nucleus. So what does it mean? So let's uh, again uh, think about this incident neutron that uh, is impinging on our uh, target nucleus. So what is take place is that this uh, neutron is absorbed by the target nucleus and the kinetic energy of this neutron is shared between the, the nucleons of the compound system. So in this way, we reach this uh, intermediate state that is called a compound nucleus that uh, lives enough to reach uh, what is called the complete statistical equilibrium. So what does it mean? This means that uh, as uh, uh, Dara is telling us, uh, uh, the system has no memory of his uh, formation channel. And uh, this means that uh, we can consider the decay of the compound nucleus uh, independent from uh, the formation. So this hypothesis is also well known as a Bohr independence hypothesis. And um, from our point of view, what is very important is uh, uh, if uh, we consider this very independent hypothesis, we can uh, then factorize uh, the newton induced reaction cross-section uh, in uh, two different terms. One that is related to the formation, so to the input of the compound nucleus, and uh, the second term that on the contrary is related to the decay of the compound nucleus. So now surrogate reactions uh, theory come at this point. So as we already said before, thanks to the Bohr independence hypothesis, we can factorize this cross section in two terms. So the first one, uh, the, which is related to the formation can be easily calculated using the optical model uh, with an uncertainty that uh, is uh, uh, below the term person. So now in a first approximation, what we can say is that the probability, there is no difference between the probability measured using the surrogate reaction and the one measured in the case of the neutron induced reactions. So uh, we can simply uh, replace uh, the probability of the neutron induced reaction with the one of the surrogate. And in this case, uh, we have all the, in the, all the elements to calculate the uh, neutron induced reaction cross section. And so we are happy and we love our job. So the problem is that uh, if we try to do uh, this uh, every time, uh, sometimes we are lucky and things are working, and sometimes we will get uh, an important uh, mismatch between uh, the newton induced uh, reaction cross section measured uh, in this case uh, and uh, in the case of uh, uh, surrogate reactions. So the point, uh, the message is that we cannot use uh, this solution um, every time, so it doesn't work every time. And the problem is that um, uh, we cannot forget uh, the conservation of quantities, like, uh, for example, the conservation of the angular momentum. And uh, for this region, uh, um, what we have is that uh, the, the spin parity distribution uh, in uh, the case of the compound nucleus provided uh, for in the case of neutron induced reaction and in the case of surrogate reaction can be uh, very different. And uh, this difference in the spin parity distribution have also a, an impact on the decay probabilities that uh, uh, in this case, we can find uh, an important mismatch between uh, the probability measured in the case of surrogate reaction and uh, the one measured in the case of neutron induced reaction. So 
what is clear is that uh, we cannot, uh, we can, we should find a different way uh, to use the surrogate reaction method. And uh, uh, this uh, alternative solution is a little bit more tricky, but uh, 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 again, uh, very interesting because uh, we can still measure uh, this uh, decay probabilities provided in the case of a surrogate reaction. And uh, we use them to uh, define and constrain a set of models parameters that uh, describe the excitation of the compound, uh, of the, the, the compound nucleus. So in this way, uh, uh, once we, uh, these parameters uh, are, have, have been tuned, uh, we can try to predict uh, the, the, zero, the newton induced reactions uh, by uh, performing theoretical calculations. So now uh, an important step towards the, the validation of this particular way of use uh, uh, the surrogate reaction has been done in the work of, uh, uh, in the thesis of Ricardo uh, Perez. So uh, in this work, uh, uh, the surrogate reaction that you can see right here in the slide, so the inelastic scattering of alpha particles uh, with the plutonium 230 has been used to produce uh, an excited plutonium 230. And uh, in this way, uh, the authors were able um, to infer the well-known uh, newton used reaction cross-section of the plutonium 239. You can see that here the compost nucleus uh, is the same. So uh, this uh, work has been also a great innovation because uh, for the first time, uh, both uh, the uh, decay probability for uh, the gamma ray emission and for the fission of the compound nucleus has been measured uh, simultaneously. But now let's see a little bit more in detail what, uh, uh, what is, uh, what is uh, going on. So um, let's see here, for example, you can see the behavior, so the decay probabilities as function of the excitation energy of the compound nucleus. So now in red, you can see the probabilities, uh, the probability behavior of the probability for the gamma ray emission. Uh, and uh, in blue, you can see on the contrary, the probability for relative to the fission of the compound nucleus. So now let's see a little bit more in detail the evolution of these uh, uh, probabilities. So first of all, for low excitation energies, you can see that uh, uh, there is uh, no additional channel available. Um, so only uh, gamma rays, uh, gamma ray, uh, the, the K comp of the component nucleus, nucleus through the gamma ray emission is possible. And so you can see that uh, the probability for the P gamma is equal to one. So as soon as uh, we have an increase of this uh, excitation energy of the compound nucleus, we can see that also uh, the fission channel start to be uh, available. And uh, at the same time, you can see that we have a decrease of the uh, decay for uh, gamma ray emission. So uh, what is uh, really important, uh, so the great advantage to measure simultaneously these uh, two probabilities is that uh, uh, this provide us any, a, a, strength, a stringent test uh, for, uh, um, to test the experimental method, because you can see that uh, here, uh, below the neutron separation energies, so the only possible decay channels uh, are, for example, the one for the gamma ray emission and one for the fission. So the sum of these two probabilities, as you can see here, um, represented with these uh, black points, must be equal to one. As soon as then we overcome uh, the neutron separation energy, uh, also the, uh, the neutron emission channel um, uh, for, as the, for the decay of the compound nucleus is accessible. And so you can see that then uh, the sum of the uh, probability uh, for the P gamma and the, uh, the probability for the fission is no more enough uh, to, to stay here uh, for, uh, to, to be equal to one. So now I want to stress two important points related to the, um, surrogate reaction. So the first one is that, as you can see, uh, the evolution of the probabilities is quite fast. So you can see that the more or less in a range of uh, uh, 1 mV, you can have a very fast uh, increase and decrease. So here is very important to uh, reach a, a higher accuracy in the evaluation of the excitation energy of the compound nucleus in order to be able to scan carefully the evolution of these decay probabilities. Uh, another important point uh, is that uh, surrogate reactions uh, is the only instrument that allows us to uh, populate excitation energies below the neutron separation energy. In uh, traditional experiments, so in traditional uh, newton induced reaction, what is uh, possible to populate are only excitation energy uh, larger than uh, the neutron separation. And here we can get very important information about the parameters that describe the excitation uh, of the compound nucleus. However, 
going back to, uh, to the work, uh, um, uh, what has been done by Ricardo and the collaborators now is to uh, use uh, the statistical um, model uh, implemented in Thales, uh, leaving uh, free some key uh, parameters in order to reproduce uh, the decay uh, probability, the measure of decay probabilities. So here with the red and blue lines, you can see the calculated probabilities and you can see that uh, they are quite in, in good agreement with the measured one. So uh, in this way, uh, they were able also to constrain uh, these uh, uh, key uh, parameters. And uh, one, this parameter has been tuned, uh, it's possible, it has been possible to infer uh, the new induced reaction cross sections of the plutonium 239. So uh, in detail, uh, they measured the fission and the capture cross section that you can see here in the slide uh, as function of the uh, kinetic energy of the incident neutron. So in detail, uh, let's start here from uh, the cross section for uh, the fission. Uh, you can see here with uh, uh, the blue uh, line, the, the results obtained in uh, this work. Uh, and this blue line is uh, inserted in a shadow hero that represent uh, the uh, different uh, the heroes. So uh, the results coming from the, the work uh, were compared with uh, the latest uh, experimental data that you can see here with the black uh, points and also with uh, uh, the different evaluation like the INDIAF, uh, the, the JAF. At the same time, uh, also the, uh, the capture uh, cross-section has been uh, measured here again as function of the kinetic energy of the incident neutron. And again, here we have in blue line, the blue line represents the, the, the results obtained with this work, the shadow hero, the heroes, and uh, the black points, uh, the latest experimental data, and with in other colors, the different evaluations. So what I want to, to underline is that uh, in you can see here the, resu the results are in, in quite agreement uh, with uh, uh, the experimental data and evaluation. What I want to remark is that uh, this uh, method that we are developing is uh, finalized to determine the neutron user reaction cross section of uh, radioactive nuclei in when uh, no data is uh, available due to the difficulty to perform uh, the related measurements or when the, uh, this cross-section are available, but they have a large uncharted list. So now this uh, experiment uh, was uh, an important step for the validation of this uh, particular way to use the surrogate reaction method. But uh, as you can see here, there are still some uh, limitations uh, related to uh, surrogate reaction experiments in direct kinematics. So let's see a little bit more in detail uh, which kind of limitation we are, uh, we are speaking about. So here uh, you can see a typical setup used for uh, the measurement or in the case of surrogate reactions in direct kinematics. So here you can see that you have a, a light uh, a beam. You remember the previous experiments, so the benchmark experiment where uh, we were looking about the uh, in elastic scattering of alpha particles with a plutonium 230. So you can see here the incoming beam that is made of these uh, alpha particles. And uh, uh, here, these alpha particles are pinging on this CV target nucleus that is uh, made of 230 plutonium isotope. And uh, so the first uh, uh, important point is that we need to underline is the detection of the, in, uh, the, the alpha particles coming from the inelastic scattering. So the detection of this particle is very important for two points of view. First of all, because uh, they are detected in coincidence with the decay of the compound nucleus. And the other point is that uh, uh, the, uh, the detection of the, the energy of this particle and also the evaluation of the uh, scattering angle are key um, elements for um, the calculation of the excitation energy of the, of the compound nucleus. At the same time, then you can see here the different uh, uh, detectors used for the detection of the fission fragments, uh, detection of gamma rays, and then neutrons. So now um, the first point that uh, the first limitation is related to the uh, heavy target nucleus. So here, uh, when we, uh, we 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 started to speak uh, about surrogate reaction, we shade we we have uh, we uh, say that uh, if we choose an appropriate combination of a beam and the target we can try to use uh, a, a more stable or less radioactive target. Uh, clearly, however, when we start to move far from the stability valley, uh, also in the case of surrogate reaction, we will need to use uh, uh, higher radioactive, radioactive targets. 
And, um, and this is clear uh, one important point. After that, we cannot forget uh, that uh, we can have uh, contaminants in our uh, heavy target that can uh, complicate significantly our measurement. But also, for example, we have also the problem of the target support. Um, another important point uh, is that the detection of the uh, products coming from the excitation of the compound nucleus. So in general, for example, for the detection of gamma rays, we have a very low uh, detection efficiency, but uh, this detection efficiency uh, is very low also in the case of neutron, because here we are speaking about uh, low energy neutrons and the detection of these uh, particles is very uh, challenging. So also in this case, we can try to overcome uh, the problems to the limitation of this of the direct kinematics and moving in inverse kinematics. So now working inverse kinematics can solve again the problem of the target radioactivity because here we are, uh, acceler we are accelerating a radioactive uh, nucleus. So for example, we have uh, access to very short-lived uh, nuclei. Uh, the other important point is that in this case, uh, uh, we have a light target. So uh, in, this, uh, in this case, uh, the heavy residues coming from uh, the decay of the compound nucleus are not stopped inside the target. And so, for example, we can uh, try to detect them. And as we will see later, this detection can be performed with high uh, efficiency. So now, uh, again, uh, uh, also in the case of surrogate reaction in the kinematics, the, the, the requirement is to, to reach uh, a resolution in the evaluation of the excitation energy of few hundred keV. So now, uh, reach this uh, resolution is quite uh, challenging and complicated uh, in uh, surrogate reaction in the kinematics uh, uh, because uh, this resolution depends uh, on different uh, uh, observables, like, for example, the uh, energy of the incoming beam, but uh, also uh, the, um, the scattering angle of the half point particles. Remember here, the, uh, the alpha particles coming from the inelastic scattering, but also the energy. And uh, the problem is that uh, in uh, surrogate reaction inverse kinematics, we can have, uh, first of all, a, a low quality of the radioactive beam. And this beam then is interacting uh, quite uh, strongly with the target. So what we have is, uh, for example, a struggle effect that can uh, reduce uh, the Hauer resolution in, uh, uh, for the scattering angle of the outgoing particle. But at the same time, we can have also uh, energy loss inside the target. And so uh, problems can uh, um, make quite quite, quite challenge uh, a, a challenge to reach uh, this uh, required resolution. So now um, the great innovation that we are proposing with the the, the nectar project is to combine uh, the surrogate reaction method in inverse kinematics uh, with uh, storage rings. So now uh, a storage ring is just a, a circular lattice, uh, as you can see here in the, in the, in the picture, um, made of uh, focusing and uh, bending elements. Uh, and I'm speaking about uh, multiple magnets, like for example, the dipoles here in white or quadruples in red, that uh, allow has to store, uh, accumulate, uh, and uh, turn at high frequency a, a beam. So now uh, storage rings are used, and uh, I would say it's a nice, uh, is a uh, quasi uh, traditional facility. Um, the problem is that uh, store heavy ions is uh, a complex, is uh, another different point because it's very very difficult, and this difficulty is just uh, provided. Uh, it can be it really can be seen uh, if we have a look to the facilities that are able to store heavy ions. There are only few in the world. And one of these uh, is uh, just uh, the, uh, the GSR uh, storage rings at the GSI fail facility that uh, you can see here uh, in the picture. So uh, the problem is that uh, um, when you have a heavy ions, um, uh, the, the, the cross section for uh, the capture or the emission of uh, electron is quite high. And so when uh, this is uh, this uh, kind of place, you can lose your uh, ion because uh, uh, it will not follow your uh, design trajectory. At the same time, uh, you can also have a, a, an energy loss uh, inside the ring. And so this is another point that can complicate significantly the, the, to, uh, the, the, the possibility to store heavy ions. So in order to, to use uh, storage rings for, uh, this, uh, for heavy ions, we should uh, 
uh, reach uh, what is called the ultra vacuum. So a vacuum halo uh, value be between uh, uh, 10 to the minus 11 and 10 to the minus 12 uh, millibar. That is, uh, just to give you an idea, between uh, six and seven order of magnitude uh, lower respect to the vacuum that is used in uh, uh, normal experiments. Uh, however, uh, once the beam uh, is, uh, so once the heavy ions uh, are stored, uh, we can access to the uh, incredible properties of these uh, facilities. Um, for example, the possibility to uh, cool uh, our beam thanks to the electron cooler, and in this way get uh, a beam of high quality from the point of view of the energy and the position. Um, at the same time, uh, um, what another important point is that at the GSI, uh, that we're able to install a gas jet target in the storage ring, so in ultra vacuum. So uh, it's possible to provide a, a ultra thin gas jet target. So now we should think that here we have a heavy ion beam that is moving, uh, for example, in the case of uh, energy of 10 mV per nucleon at one megahertz. So uh, this means that uh, uh, the effective density of uh, this target is increased by one million of times. Uh, and so um, also if the target is thin, um, we can reach the required statistic without the problems. And at the same time, another important property is that uh, also if the beam is passing through the target and clearly the quality of the beam is, uh, um, is getting worse due to this, uh, thanks to the electron cooler, it's possible to restore um, the, uh, the beam. And, and so this is something of a uh, unique. Uh, for sure, uh, this ultra vacuum is uh, a very bad guy, and uh, also in, when you when you want to design your setup, uh, you should take into account uh, about this. So now, uh, just coming to the uh, first experiment that you want to perform in the framework of the Nectar project, that is the proof of principle experiment at the ESR storage rings. So this experiment will be the first time we will uh, combine for uh, we combine surrogate reaction method in inverse kinematics and the storage rings. So this experiment will take place uh, in the, the 2022, and uh, in this case we will use uh, this surrogate reaction. So the inelastic scattering of lead 208. Uh, uh, with the protons uh, in order to infer the neutral used reaction of lead 207. Okay, you can see also here that we are able to reach the same uh, compound nucleus. So uh, in detail, what we will do again is to measure, you see again, the words simultaneously, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the gamma uh, the, 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 the gamma and the neutron emission probabilities as function of the excitation energy. So now let's see a little bit more in detail uh, the setup that we will use. So here, as you can see, just um, a draft of this setup uh, inside our ring. So uh, we will use uh, a lead beam at 30 mV per nucleon in pinging on a gas jet target. So now uh, the kinematics of uh, two uh, body interaction involving a, a heavy ion beam and a, a light target uh, leads in this case to uh, a, a target like uh, to the uh, emission of a target like a uh, residue uh, that uh, in this case uh, are uh, the protons coming from the elastic and the uh, inelastic scattering that we will detect using this uh, target like uh, residue uh, detector. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, uh, we have the emission of a, a pretty like uh, residue that, on the contrary, is uh, uh, forward is, uh, is uh, emitted with a very small uh, angle. And uh, what is uh, very uh, important to underline is that here, uh, the heavy residues coming from uh, the gamma ray emission and the neutron emission uh, will, uh, um, will be propagated with the main beam uh, along the, the section of our ring, uh, and they will pass through this dipole. So now, uh, thanks to the dipole, uh, we will be able to discriminate these uh, heavy residues uh, because they have, in the case of the gamma rays, a different energy or in the case of the neutron uh, emission, a lower mass. So you can see here that just placing a, a detector down to the dipole, we will be able to detect this uh, heavy residues. So now the point is that uh, we will be able, as I said, to uh, measure these decay probabilities as function of the excitation energy of the compound nucleus. And uh, uh, we will perform this uh, calculating the, the ratio between uh, the number of uh, ECV residues coming from a, a specific decay channels uh, detected in coincidence with the target-like uh, residues uh, 
uh, divided by uh, the total number of target like residues uh, detected. Um, and everything will, uh, and, and then we will correct uh, everything with the efficiency for the detection of this, uh, uh, of the heavy residues uh, downstream uh, that we uh, detect uh, for the specific decay channel. So now uh, the first question is uh, why we use lead? So what you should think now is that uh, um, uh, this is a proof of principle. So what we want to, to do is to learn as much as possible, but uh, uh, also get uh, important uh, information uh, um, about, uh, uh, for example, uh, in relation also to uh, our uh, simulation. So uh, the, first of all, the lead uh, is, uh, can be produced quite easily at, uh, with high intensity at the GSI fair uh, facility. This is the first point. The second point is that the ground state and the, and the first set of states of lead uh, 208 are well separated, as you can see here in the spectra. And this is very important because in this way, we will get a, a, a really a important information about our real experimental resolution on the evaluation of the excitation energy of the compound nucleus. And we were able to compare this experimental result with our um, simulations. So for these properties, let's fit uh, quite uh, nicely the, the idea of this uh, proof of principle. But uh, uh, finally, if things will uh, work uh, quite uh, nicely, we will be able also to provide the interesting data uh, for in, uh, the, to infer the newton induced uh, the reaction cross-section of uh, lead 207. So now I just want to show you some uh, uh, results uh, related to um, how our simulations work. Um, so, um, in order to, I mean, understand what we will uh, really uh, see uh, during uh, this uh, proof of principle uh, experiment, uh, we have, we uh, perform a carefully simulation in order to understand, for example, which is the, the lowest uh, energy uh, resolution, the excitation energy of the compound nucleus that we can reach. So here you can see a plot uh, where you can see the excitation energy spectra of uh, lead 208 uh, obtained simulating the detection uh, with uh, the setup that we use uh, really at uh, here at the ESR. Um, so, um, sorry, we will uh, simu we simulate the detection of the, the protons coming from the inelastic and the elastic scattering. And uh, you can see here that uh, we we'll, uh, have a resolutive power is quite high. And so that we can see uh, very nicely, for example, the ground state, but also the first state states of the lead. So from uh, our uh, simulation, we, we have seen that we can reach uh, with uh, this setup uh, 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 and uh, resolution in uh, the excitation energy that is uh, more or less of uh, 200 kV. That is already something of uh, amazing. Uh, if, for example, we have in mind uh, the uh, typical resolution of uh, um, heavy ion single pass experiment, uh, which is uh, just a little bit uh, larger than uh, that is larger than one mV. What I want to underline is that uh, this uh, uh, energy resolution is what we will uh, obtain in this experiment, uh, but we can do also better uh, improving, for example, um, some properties uh, of our detectors, like, for example, the granularity. So the point is that I want to underline is that we can also do uh, better. So uh, another important uh, point related to our um, uh, simulation is uh, that uh, is the transmission uh, efficiency of the heavy residues, but also our ability to discriminate uh, the heavy ions coming from the different decay channels. So here, just to go back, you can you can see uh, the position of uh, um, these uh, heavy residues. Uh, at the, the detector, if we think to place a detector here uh, downstream the, the dipole. So uh, uh, here you can see uh, here the unreacted beam, uh, this is represented with this uh, dotted line, um, while uh, the, the blue line is representing the, the heavy residues coming from uh, the gamma ray emission is uh, re reproduced here. Well, here in, on the contrary in green, we have, uh, as you see here for the line, the heavy residues coming from the uh, neutron uh, emission. So what is important to underline is that you can see that we have a, a quite nice uh, ability to discriminate the heavy residues coming from uh, these two different uh, channels. And uh, what I want to underline is that if we consider the heavy residues uh, uh, detection efficiency, but also the transmission efficiency, 
that is our ability to to to, uh, to propagate uh, without uh, um, uh, missing uh, our heavy residues from uh, the the target uh, the heavy residues from the target up to the uh, detection station here downstream the dipole, uh, we can reach uh, an efficiency of the ninety nine percent. That is something of huge if we if, uh, if we have in mind if we have in mind for example um, the uh, dark kinematics experiments where the detection of the the gamma rays. Uh, is uh, around the five percent, and but for example, the detection of a neutron is quite challenging, and sometimes it's not possible. So, up to now, what we will uh, uh, do is to uh, use uh, uh, the double safe strip detector here to uh, detect uh, uh, the heavy ions in uh, storage rings. But uh, we will know that we, we know that these detectors uh, will uh, get uh, uh, will be damaged uh, during the experiment. So uh, for the future, what we want to do is to, uh, to use uh, solar cells uh, to detect uh, heavy ions in uh, storage rings. So now when we speak about solar cells, we just speak about the, the, the semiconductor devices which are uh, used for the conversion of solar energy and that uh, we know they are using the space or here in the herd. So uh, the possibility uh, to use uh, solar cells for the detection of EV ions is not so exotic, and they were used for this uh, proposal already in the 1979. Um, what is important on the line, however, is that uh, the charge collection process in solar cells is very different respect to the one in standard silicon detectors. And uh, the possibility to detect EV ions is uh, due to an effect that is called field funneling effect, um, which is uh, uh, directly related to the ionization uh, profile of, of the incoming uh, particle. So now from our side, uh, um, we are studying the possibility to use uh, solar cells for this uh, purpose uh, since the 2018. And uh, we are firmly convinced that, that solar cells represent uh, a very interesting uh, alternative option to uh, silicon detectors for the detection of the EV ions. So uh, we can say this uh, thanks to their uh, amazing properties, like for example, uh, an energy and time resolution uh, that is a very uh, interesting uh, for fission fragments at energies uh, about one maybe per nuclear. Nucleon, their uh, um, better radiation resistance that the, uh, that, uh, the solar cells have demonstrated already at uh, these uh, energies. But uh, after that, also, we cannot forget uh, the price because uh, they are very cheap uh, compared to the silicon detectors and uh, they are also quite robust. So now, all these properties make sense an interesting alternative to silicon detectors, but uh, things are not so easy because uh, due to the uh, intrinsic uh, properties, uh, solar cells are characterized by a high capacitance, uh, which is uh, more or less 1000 times larger respect to the one in uh, standard silicon uh, detectors. And this capacitance is increasing uh, linearly, uh, linear, uh, linearly with uh, uh, the, the surface. So, uh, uh, so in order to uh, to be uh, to to use solar cells for our proposed to detect TV ions at the energies above one mV per nucleon in storage rings, uh, we should investigate uh, um, where or we are working in three different uh, uh, points. The first one is the development of a special of a special kind of pre amplifier system that are fundamental in order to use solar cells for this proposal. So now um, uh, this work is made by our research engineer. And uh, so things uh, are almost done. So this uh, preamplifier I quite close to be optimized. Uh, optimized so um, this uh, point uh, is almost uh, concluded. Um, the, the other point uh, is that, that we should be sure about uh, the high uh, performances of the solar cells from the point of view of the energy and time resolution when they are irradiated with uh, heavy ion beam at energies above uh, one mV per nucleon. And uh, for this, we are performing tests uh, in uh, Ganilda. So the last point is uh, finally to, to check, you see that is coming back, the compatibility of solar cells with the ultra vacuum. And uh, in order to uh, check uh, this uh, property of solar cells, we, are, uh, we have here at uh, our laboratory um, a vacuum uh, test line that is called uh, uh, travel. So 
Now, from the point of view of the energy and timer response of the solar cells, I just want to show you some results coming from our uh, latest test performed in uh, Ghanin. So during this test, we have uh, irradiated solar cells with uh, a Krypton beam at uh, three different uh, energies, so 5, 10, and 50 mV per nucleon. So here you can see just the energy resolution and the time resolution of the solar cells. And uh, so the best results we obtain below to uh, this uh, silicon substrate uh, solar cells that is more or less of 10 by 10 millimeter cells, so it's quite small. And this uh, germanium substrate uh, solar cells that is more or less 20 by 20 uh, millimeter cells, so it's more or less four times larger respect to the previous one. So let's start, first of all, from the, the first plot here, where you can see the energy resolution as function of the excitation energy, uh, uh, as function of the energy of the, uh, of the beam. So uh, as you can see, uh, the behavior of the solar cells is compared with uh, the response of a silicon uh, detector. So uh, what is important to remark, you can see is that uh, the, uh, it's amazing. So the solar cells can provide uh, an energy uh, resolution that is uh, close to the uh, to a person, so this is something of uh, very uh, interesting. But uh, what is uh, also more interesting is this value obtained in the case of the uh, Germanium uh, solar cells, where you can see that at 5 mV per nucleon, the behavior is uh, very close to the silicon uh, detector. Uh, uh, from the point of view of the of the time resolution that you can see here again as function of the uh, energy of the, of the beam. Uh, um, you can see that uh, for the germanium, we can have uh, a time resolution that is below three uh, nanoseconds. And again, this is uh, already an important result. Um, so what I want to stress again is uh, that uh, from the point of view also of the possible use of solar cells for the nectar project, we are seeing that it is important to detect heavy ions in coincidence uh, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, target like residues. And so it's very important in this case uh, that you, we can see that uh, the time resolution is, is quite nice. So uh, the additional point uh, that we have, uh, for example, investigated during the, the latest experiment uh, in Ganila is related to the radiation test. So these radiation tests uh, are very important because, uh, uh, and here we go back again uh, to the problem of the ultra vacuum uh, uh, compatibility. Because you should think that uh, in order to reach uh, the ultra vacuum in uh, storage rings, uh, um, uh, we, uh, there is a lot of work that is been done and it, it takes, for example, weeks to reach this uh, ultra vacuum conditions. So this means that when you put your detector uh, inside, you should be sure that it will uh, continue to work um, up, to the, up to the end of your experiment. And here, the, and the requirement to, to be sure that the performances of the detector will remain uh, the same. Um, also, when these detectors are exposed to a high um, irradiation fluxes, integrated fluxes, so here, in particular, we have uh, um, irradiated solar cells with a krypton beam at 50 mV per nucleon. So here, uh, you can see that the time response of uh, a silicon uh, substrate uh, solar cells uh, that is compared with the response of uh, a standard silicon detector. So now let's start from the silicon detector. Here you can see that, that this uh, blue distribution represents the response of the silicon detector before the uh, irradiation. So you see that uh, as we increase the uh, integrated flux, uh, we can see a degradation of the uh, response of the, uh, of the silicon detector. That, uh, and this response is getting worse. You can see also that the spread is increasing. So the time resolution is decreasing uh, as we reach uh, a high integrated flux. So if we now we have a look uh, to the behavior of the solar cells, things are very uh, amazing because we can see that uh, there is uh, no real uh, difference between uh, the behavior before and uh, after uh, the radiation. So you can see that uh, uh, there is no change also in the, in the time response. And this is very important and important results uh, if we think that we want to use solar cells um, in, uh, uh, in storage rings. So now, so in this way, I just, uh, I, I came to the, uh, to the conclusions. So I just want to make a, a big review of the, uh, of the presentation. And uh, what I want to say is that uh, the Nectar project uh, represents a, a unique uh, possibility, thanks to this uh, idea to combine the surrogate reaction method in inverse kinematics with storage rings 
to infer uh, indirectly the newt induced reaction cross section of uh, a short lived uh, nuclei. So uh, now, with uh, this, our, uh, this first experiment, that is this proof of principle experiment, um, we will, uh, uh, first of all, uh, test our experimental methodology. Um, because this will be the, the first time we combine this uh, method and uh, storage, uh, we'll use the surrogate reaction method in uh, the storage rings, but also it will be important to benchmark uh, how our uh, simulation work. Um, uh, the additional point is that we can get uh, important uh, information to our uh, future uh, experiments uh, that we will perform uh, uh, again, uh, maybe uh, at, uh, um, uh, at the GSI uh, fair, um, uh, storage rings complex. So from the point of view on the contrary of uh, the solar cells, we have uh, demonstrated thanks to the latest uh, experiments that they can uh, provide uh, high performances uh, up to uh, energy of 15 MeV per nucleon of the heavy ions uh, from the point of view of the energy and time uh, resolution. At the same time, we have also seen um, uh, the high radiation damage uh, resistance that is an important property so we want to use uh, solar cells as uh, EV ions detectors in storage rings. Uh, the last point uh, that uh, we still uh, miss, uh, mi we are still missing, is the, the ultra vacuum compatibility of uh, uh, solar cells, and it's something that we will uh, study uh, during um, um, here at the Saint Berger using our uh, test line. So, okay, so uh, in this way, I hope so the time should be okay. I, I, I hope that I, I didn't bother you uh, with this presentation. I hope that I I give you uh, new uh, ideas, so uh, explaining about these uh, new possibilities provided by uh, the Nectar project. And I want to thank you again for your uh, attention.